Hey everyone, this lecture is on social change and it is lecture 13.1. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about what exactly social change is, a few theories of social change, uh, how collective behavior works, we will talk about social movements, and then we'll talk a little bit about how technology can impact social change. So sociologists define social change as the transformation of a culture over time. This can be either intended and deliberate, which usually uh, is through an organization or is a little bit political, a lot political, or social change can be unplanned and unintended. And then of course, some social changes are more controversial than others, and those controversial ones usually take the forms of being involved in politics in one way or another. There are many ways that social change can occur. Those listed on this slide are those that are unintentional social change. So it could be a major physical event. That can be a type of social change, something like a hurricane or an earthquake. Or we could look at demographic factors. So uh, the aging of the baby boomers. And as that generation have moved through their life course at every step, in their lives because of their sheer numbers they have created some kind of social change reflective of that life period that that huge group of people is in and then things like discoveries and innovations things like satellite communications technologies things like uh, smartphones for example have really shaped our modern lives and as I mentioned, though, the most important, most significant, and most political social changes have occurred through uh, collective action. They have been intentional. Things like the American labor movement, what's commonly called the union movement in the United States. Uh, the union movement had dramatically more impact in the beginning of the 20th century, but still exists to this day. Uh, things like the civil rights movement, in uh, the 1960s and 70s that uh, sought out equal rights for not only uh, black people but other people of different races and ethnicities. The gay rights movement in the later part of the 20th century uh, continuing into the modern era. But we also have newer movements such as the Me Too movement which is roughly associated with modern feminism. And then also groups like Black Lives Matter which uh, certainly has a strong connection to the civil rights movement, but uh, BLM is actually its own social movement and its own thing. So let's talk a little bit about some social change theory. So, uh, and I'm sorry it says other theories there, that's a bit of a typo. Uh, resource mobilization theory is one of the big uh, social theories uh, laid out uh, here and it really I like it because it gives a good example of what social change theories could look like uh, The theories presented in this presentation aren't all of the social change theories But they kind of give you a flavor of the kind of thing we see in social change theory uh, resource mobilization theory uh, contends that success in a social movement is determined by ability to generate money membership or political support or all of these uh, all of these uh, so uh, one social movement uh, one uh, effort I was involved with in 2008 I was uh, at a very low level employed by uh, the Obama campaign and uh, in the Obama campaign uh, and in any presidential campaign for example uh, there is a very important financial deadline uh, of the August before the November election. And at the end of that August before an election, um, you have a pretty good gauge of how the election is actually going to pan out based on uh, the amount of money raised by uh, either candidate. So, uh, for example, if the Republican candidate has raised a whole lot more money than the Democrat candidate, then that would indicate that the Republican was probably going to win and vice versa. Um, but if it's, it's very tight in that uh, August uh, deadline, then that would indicate that it's going to be a more of a tight election. 
Now, what we saw in the 2008 campaign was that it was a very tight fundraising cycle, right? So in August of 2008, we didn't really know who was going to win. It wasn't clear to us uh, whether Obama was going to win or McCain was going to win. But so so that illustrates uh, that uh, one element of resource mobilization theory being the finances. But Obama had this other thing that wasn't fully understood at that time. Barack Obama, in his life prior to being a politician, was a community organizer. And as a community organizer, he had a knowledge of how to get volunteers, uh, people who are, probably aren't being paid anything or might be being paid relatively little, how to get them to really give their all to the campaign, right? That's, that's called a community organizing. And that ability to do that, which uh, gave the uh, his uh, campaign and the Democratic Party of that era kind of that really invigorated boost, his ability to do that was his own resource outside of the ability to generate money. Uh, so it both illustrates um, it, the, the 2008 Obama campaign really illustrates multiple layers of resource mobilization theory. Um, and, but since, the, since 2008, the Republican Party has come to uh, figuring that out uh, much more than they did in 2008. Uh, but that was a v pretty new idea in politics uh, during that era. And any time when one candidate or another really becomes aware of a new thing or how to use a new thing in a way that the other side doesn't, you, you see that resource mobilization. Another social movement theory is uh, contagion theory. Now, contagion theory is pretty good for explaining uh, micro level phenomena, uh, things like uh, on the ground rioting. So uh, we, we see uh, people that some sort of civil disturbance, right? Uh, we see uh, a riot at a protest or we see a riot uh, at a supermarket or we see something like a uh, riot after uh, a team wins a championship. Uh, that can all tie into contagion theory. And effectively what it states is that those people who are present at a location can kind of get swept up in the mob mentality of the group, right? So in this way, the human mind becomes infected by the behaviors of other people surrounding them. This is an okay theory, uh, but uh, from my perspective, uh, the way I interpret contagion theory, it really requires the people involved in the event to be altered in some way, to be uh, maybe very hungry, or maybe very uh, intoxicated, or maybe very angry. And in that already being altered state, then the person is more inclined to take part in the destructive activity and thus get infected by the mob mentality. Uh, contagion theory is remarkably good for uh, explaining behavior such as uh, celebratory rioting in which uh, basically sometimes people tear their city apart after they win a major sports game. Uh, that is, um, that's the application I find most convincing with uh, contagion theory. Emergent norm theory is a slightly different uh, idea tied in uh, pretty similar to contagion theory, but a lot different actually. And in emergent norm theory, uh, we see people, instead of getting infected with the collective behavior of the group, we see people who are, are effectively voting subconsciously on the group's behavior. That's emergent norm theory. So uh, let's say you're all at a protest or all at a rally, and uh, the, the speaker gets uh, kind of riled up, and starts 
um, getting, you know, really impassioned, right? And people are nodding their heads going, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we really, this is a, this is a big important thing. And then one person in the crowd picks up a rock and throws it at the cops that are bystanders, that are the, the cops that are observing the rally, because cops do that. It's part of the job. Well, in that moment, all of the people at the rally then are making a, a micro decision. They are all deciding, do we approve of the behavior of the person who threw the rock, or do we oppose the people who threw the rock, right? And if you say yes, we don't like the cops either, maybe another person will throw a rock, and then a whole bunch of people start throwing rocks, right? And that drives the police away. And, and then in those micro decisions, effectively in those subconscious voting then, that determines the nature of the behavior of the group. Or it can go the other way. Maybe after the person throws the rock, everyone else present in the group says, you know what, that is completely uncalled for. Hey police, look at him over here. He threw the rock, come get him, right? And then in that way, the people saying, hey, come get him, they are also voting to say, what kind of group is it going to be? What do we approve of as people who are standing here, right? That's how emergent norm theory works. And then also to a degree, those people who approve of what everyone else around them is doing, they'll stay in the crowd, right? But if people disapprove of what the rest of the crowd's doing or they get scared, they may leave. And in some people deciding to leave after a decision is made, it makes the emergent norm, it makes the collective decision all the stronger then. That, those are the ideas tied up in this set of social theory. Uh, to slightly transition, let's talk a little bit about social dilemmas. Social dilemmas are elements in our society that uh, drive, um, that, 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 that are created when a behavior is rational for an individual, but can lead to collective disaster when practiced by many people. So most of our uh, problems as a modern society are based on the fact that you are doing something that makes sense for you to do, but if everybody does it, then uh, we're, it's going to create a problem, right? That's, that's part of our human behavior that we haven't quite uh, got fixed uh, in terms of living in uh, modern societies. There are many types of social dilemmas, but here are two commonly discussed types of social dilemmas to give you an idea as to what we're talking about here. Uh, first, we have the tragedy of the common social dilemma. This occurs when many individuals overexploit a public resource for personal gain, and in that they either deplete or degrade that resource, uh, something like uh, littering. If one person uh, decides to just throw their garbage on the ground, and they're the only person around for hundreds of miles, it really doesn't have an impact on, on the local ecology, right? But if we all do it, then uh, nature, our ecosystem, whatever, will get damaged pretty fast, right? Uh, most, uh, most social dilemmas related to pollution or ecological problems uh, can be classified as tragedy of the commons dilemmas. But then we also have a public goods dilemma. This occurs when individuals must contribute to a collective resource, even though they may not directly benefit from it. Uh, so uh, to make the thing work, everyone has to give some money or some effort to it. And uh, in our society especially, sometimes people don't like doing that thing. Uh, car insurance, uh, health insurance, um, taxes, uh, all of those, uh, most of those play into the public goods dilemma in one way or another. Uh, if nobody pays their taxes, then basically uh, the services that we get 
from the government, such as fixing roads uh, and other services. Uh, they, they don't work. Now we're going to move a bit into talking about collective behavior and I am going to make uh, pay attention here, especially the difference between collective behavior and mass behavior, because that's a place where people sometimes get mixed up. So collective behavior occurs when a group or crowd of people form together to take action toward a shared goal. So all of these things listed here are types of collective behavior. Uh, so a craze or a rumor and all of these all of these have their own slide I just looked ahead so types of collective behavior include a craze a rumor a social movement a riot or mass behavior so mass behavior is a type of collective behavior and then mass behavior can be broken down into fads and fashions and each of these has their own slides as I said so a craze is an intense attraction to an object, a person, or an activity. Uh, and I, I don't like that I put that term body disfigurement there. Body modification is a much better term. Um, there are trends, uh, for example, uh, among a lot of things of shaping our bodies and doing things. Uh, one of those uh, can be uh, a type of piercing uh, maybe a, a more permanent type of piercing and uh, in those moments then uh, we see what types of pierce in older people now uh, what types of piercings were really popular like 20 years ago because that's part of uh, certain older people's bodies that can be a craze or it can be a intense interest in uh, certain celebrities right uh, those those can be crazes um, following uh, certain celebrity uh, court cases that are really salacious can be parts of crazes, right? It's, it's, a, it's an intense interest in a thing. Uh, so really, if you want to modify that there, um, interest in celebrities is a much better example of a craze. Uh, body, body modification or disfigurement are more uh, part of um, fads and fashion. Uh, if you want to reclassify that. Rumors then are unverified information transmitted informally, usually originating from an unknown source. So uh, sociologists Alport and Postman uh, reflect that rumors often tie in with belief systems of those passing them along. So if you don't trust the government uh, or if you don't trust big corporations, you may be more likely to repeat a rumor you heard that said, yeah, well, you know, the government's spraying us all with uh, toxins to make us infertile, right? It's that's, that's not true, right? But you may be more likely to say that if you are uh, concerned with uh, government corruption, or maybe if you're concerned with fertility, right? Those those might be rumors you would be uh, more likely to spread. Rumors, it should be noted, often tap into our collectively held beliefs and our fears, as well as our hopes, right? We spread rumors because it, it touches us in some emotional way. And we think that when we're spreading rumors, usually that we're helping people out, or at least that people will find those things interesting. So uh, social movements are a form of collective behavior that causes social change. Uh, other, and I'm going to talk a bit more about social movements later on. I just wanted to note that there. Other forms of collective behavior then are uh, a crowd. Uh, a crowd is a very subdued uh, collective behavior uh, in which uh, just people are all in the same place at the same time. That's all a crowd is. It, it, there's very little organized about a crowd. Uh, it's just people in a spot. So people on a bus, people in a movie theater, people waiting in line for something, that's all a crowd is. A riot then is continuous disorderly behavior by a group of people that disturbs the peace and is directed toward other people and or property. So uh, riots, as I alluded to, are uh, 
most often the subject of emergent norm theory and of um, uh, uh, contagion theory. Sorry, my, my brain skipped for a second there. And then mass behavior being a type of collective behavior occur when large groups of people engage in similar behaviors without necessarily being in the same place. This is at least um, in the, the classical uh, sociological definitions, uh, not counting um, the internet as being a place. It are certain online environments places where people can do things? That's, that's a matter of debate and speculation, uh, very interestingly. But mass behavior is done then by people who are not necessarily in the same place at the same time. So as I mentioned, mass behavior has two types, fads and fashions. So fads are interests or practices followed enthusiastically for a relatively short period of time. Uh, this could be, hey, everyone's doing this hobby. Uh, hey, everybody is very interested in eating kale these days uh, or a given kind of probiotic or in my neighborhood for a, a couple years ago, everyone was super interested in brewing hard cider in their basement. Well, those are examples of fads, right? Uh, think of it in terms of a new hobby everyone's doing all at once. That's a fad. A fashion then is a widespread custom or style of behavior and appearance at a particular time in a particular place. Think of fashion more in terms of the way you present yourself, the way you dress yourself, uh, more your physical possessions. Those typically have more to do with fashion. So I alluded to earlier body modification. Body modification uh, is uh, best classified as a form of fashion. So let's talk a little bit more about social movements. As I mentioned, social movements are a type of collective behavior and social movements then, uh, or activist movements, you could call them as well, uh, refer to any social group with the following. So uh, let me t take back uh, a step there for a second. Uh, social movements, so things like the Civil Rights Movement, things like Black Lives Matter, uh, these kinds of um, societal phenomena. Social movements are made up almost always of multiple social movement organizations, right? So you look back at the Civil Rights Movement of the 1970s. Well, Martin Luther King was not the leader of the civil rights movement. He was the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was a specific social movement organization that took part in the overall um, civil rights movement, right? So a social movement uh, is made up of multiple social movement organizations. And a social movement organization to be classified as such must have these three qualities. They must have leadership. There has to be a person in charge. They must have organization. There needs to be a structure or hierarchy to the group or at a bare minimum, a way to become a member. And it has to have uh, an ideological commitment to promote or resist social change. It has to have something it wants to change, right? A cupcake, uh, a bakery might have a boss, it might have employees and organization, but unless it actually is trying to cause social change, which most bakeries aren't, they're just making baked goods, they are not social movements, they are a, a different type of organization. And I like to point out uh, when we talk about social movements. Now, this is more generally talking about social movements, not social movement organizations. Uh, because society is constantly changing, new social movements and different opportunities for activism are constantly emerging. Uh, activism is defined as any activity that brings about social change. So uh, sometimes, and this is an idea that's kind of fading, 
given how our society is changing. Sometimes people think, well, people used to do activism, but that doesn't exist anymore. That simply isn't true. Every society always has activism. It just sometimes can look a little bit different. Now, activists can be either professional or amateur. Um, and there are benefits and drawbacks to both having professional activists and amateur activists, but all social movements need, bo need both professional and amateur activists. An example of a professional uh, activist would be someone like a union organizer, a social worker, a community organizer. So these are people that are paid uh, amounts, that are paid salaries to advocate for the organization and to bring their uh, specialties into the fold of um, really making the group work, right? And I'll say, as I, I was a union organizer in, in the past, a paid union organizer. I've done unpaid union organizing work too. Uh, union organizers, same with social workers, same with community organizers, are usually paid very, very little. Nobody ever gets rich doing these professions. They, they do these jobs because they're passionate about them, but uh, they uh, should be paid so that they can do that stuff full time. That's the point to being a union organizer. Because if you don't have professional activists, then that means only the amateurs can actually dedicate themselves to doing the thing. Well, if you are not being paid to do, do these things, then you have to have another job, right? And in doing that other job, you're not actually able to put everything into the actual organizing. And that being able to pay people to do this work adds a level of complexity to the work that uh, really contributes to the su success of the organization. There are two general types of social movements. They are either regressive or progressive. So a regressive social movement is uh, one that attempts to stop social change or attempts to take it back to a previous way that things used to be. Progressive social movements then uh, try to cause new social change they tr want to take society to a place where it never has been before. Those are the two broad uh, differences there. Now, uh, if you're at all uh, politically aware and politically savvy, you may look at this and say, okay, well, regressive movements are conservative and progressive movements are liberal. In general, that, that does tend to be true, but uh, that is not always the case. Uh, you look at environmentalist movements as an example of how that's not always the case. Usually environmentalist movements classify as being either being like liberal, being things that Democrats are interested in, uh, if you're going to make those broad classifications. Well, environmentalist organizations want to protect a resource or maybe make it the way it used to be, right? So in that way, environmentalist movements organizations, while they are liberal-ish, they actually are also regressive. So uh, another uh, point of interest regarding social movements and activist organizations is why do people become activists and why do people sometimes not become activists? Well, there are multiple factors laying in there. Uh, they can uh, maybe if they identify with the group or with the cause of the group, that will cause someone to become involved in the organization. And if you become involved in the organization, you are more likely to get more involved if you have one of these classifications. If you had prior contact with other social movements, so if you've been an activist in the past, you may be more likely to join a group and be an activist in the future. If your friend groups, your social networks support the movement, then you may be likely to be involved in the movement. If you have either a personal or a family history of activism, you yourself are more likely to become an activist. If you lack practical constraints, what does that mean? 
if you are a young person without kids or maybe a, a spouse, that is makes for someone who's more likely to get involved in a movement. And if you have a strong sense of moral rightness, some people have that, some people don't. Uh, but if you have that strong sense of, well, this is the right thing to do, like deep in you, and that means so much to you, well, then you might be a person who's more likely to become involved in activism. Uh, all, okay, that, that's good there. Uh, you can read up on the free rider pro problem in our textbook. I'm, I'm just going to kind of pass that so this lecture isn't too overwhelmingly long. So uh, last thing we're addressing is technology and social change. So uh, sociologists have de developed a number of theories to explain the role of technology in social change. Uh, and to tie that in then, we have this broader concept of technological determinism. This is the concept that technology plays a defining role in shaping society. So uh, technology determines what we can or can't do in society. You are taking part in an online course, right? If not for your computer, if not for the internet, if not for all the technology involved in that, you would not be able to do that. You would not have been able to do this in the 1980s, right? Uh, this is an experience that your grandparents never had in college, right? That is uh, an example of technological determinism. And technological determinism plays a part, not, a, not a necessarily a super strong part, but plays a part in these phenomena that I'm talking about on the next slide. The phenomena of culture lag, cultural diffusion, cultural imperialism, and cultural leveling. First, culture lag refers to the time between cha changes in material culture or technology and the resulting change in broader culture's relevant norms, values, meanings, and laws. This happens a lot. We get a new technology introduced into our society, and it takes a while for us to figure out what is the polite way to use this thing, right? We see a lot of culture lag in people who are, set, at this point, let's say people over the age of 60, engaged in uh, social media. Uh, this is not something they were taught how to do growing up, right? This is something that they had to learn how to do already by the time that we would, well, let's, they, they're already middle-aged or old when they had to learn how to do this stuff, right? So as such, their moms, their dads, their, their, their churches, whatever, didn't teach them the ethical way to use those things. And so that's, that accounts for a lot of kind of the, the mean, gross, or inappropriate behavior of older adults in using internet communication because they never learned how to do it politely. Cultural diffusion then refers to the spread of material and non-material culture to new groups regardless of the movement of people. What does this mean? This is the spread of an idea even if people themselves are not spreading uh, or in an area. So for example, um, in the Southwest in the United States, there have be, has been Mexican-ish food there for hundreds of years, right? But in, uh, say, the state of Maine, there are very few uh, Latinx people actually living in, in the Northeast, right? But yet, there are still Taco Bells and Mexican restaurants in the state of Maine. How, does that, how did that come to be? Well, the, the idea of tacos, the idea of Mexican food, whether it is or is not authentic, has spread, has diffused across our society and across our culture. And that is uh, what that there, uh, that's cultural diffusion. Cultural imperialism and cultural leveling then are two interrelated concepts. Cultural imperialism refers to the cultural influence caused by adopting another culture's products rather than imposing military force. So this is 
uh, pretty, it's a modern phenomena in which one society basically takes control of another society by selling them stuff, by making their stuff look hyper appealing. Uh, this is one criticism that has been made against the United States by other countries uh, with, say, the spread of movies from Hollywood, the spread of American name brands globally. Uh, other countries make the con they, they make the argument that, well, since you're spreading your American stuff everywhere, then our, it, it's, it's weakening our society. It's causing that next thing, cultural leveling. And cultural leveling is the process by which societies lose their uniqueness and become increasingly similar. This is a side effect we have of the global of globalization phenomena, wherein people, um, societies, we all globally are becoming more and more similar to each other. And that, that can create kind of some beautiful moments, but it also can create uh, some elements where people, uh, some peop some societies are effectively becoming erased by uh, the dominant uh, global culture. Okay, that is it for this lecture. Uh, as with everything else, uh, if you have any questions, just please let me know.